I'm going to show you some work from, uh, in, a lot of the work in this, in this show will be from five years ago, and then there's some work I'm going to show you prior to that, just so you can see kind of an evolution of, of the work and how it got to where it is now. All right, so well, this first photograph is just kind of a, it's kind of a joke, but also uh, a pretty good representation of what I feel furniture and just the whole world of building is and uh, having fun. And this is just a man who put a, a, a outboard motor on a, on a table, used it as a boat. It's a lot how I view my work today is really a combination of boat building skills, furniture, you know, hydrodynamics, all of that. So, as Nicholas said, I transferred from Kansas City Art Institute into, into RISD um, from a metalworking background. And with working with metal, you can, you can stretch metal, you can, you can contract metal, you can make it achieve compound curves very easily, just with a little elbow grease. And when I went to RISD, it was predominantly a wood program. And in working with wood, there are many rules, and you can't stretch wood, and you can't contract wood. So uh, you can't really achieve compound curves, per se, with the material of wood. Um, uh, but a professor there um, actually told me of a, a method of uh, coopering, which is a method of uh, barrel making. And with this method, you basically uh, you have several staves of wood, and you cut them at a specific taper and an angle. And when you put them together, they achieve kind of a compound geometry. Um, so it's, in a way, it's like a superficial way of achieving a compound curve. You get the same geometric strength of a compound curve without the necessity to stretch a material. So this is, this is the first project in wood that I was actually really, really uh, happy with and actually got me excited about using the material and um, started to see some kind of potential work that I could really enjoy using the material of wood. Uh, it's a box. It's about 30 inches long. And when you push on the lever on the end, the door flips open, and there's a uh, orthographic drawing of itself inside. When you let go of the lever, the door snaps shut with a, there's a bunch of mechanisms inside of there to make this thing operate. Uh, this is just a bunch of work that I, that I made th through my time at, at RISD, which is just all, it's all coopering, and it's all achieving compound curves with wood. And they're all different, different, uh, different, different challenges that, that I wanted to work with. So. Um, there are different structural challenges, and that's what I was obsessed with. Uh, these, I don't know if you can see the mouse. Can you see the mouse on there? Um, so like these, these are chairs, you know, like, like lounge chairs, and it's just two pieces of bent wood uh, laminated on a mold. There's no steam bending here at all. And they're just leaned into each other at, at that slight cant, then it, it, it becomes kind of like a, a crease in a leaf on a plant. So that, that little crease on a leaf gives a leaf structure so it doesn't just flop over, right? A little crease makes the leaf have a certain uh, rigidity. And that was kind of the premise between those, those lounge chairs. Um, and these benches were not really benches, they were more miniature bridges to me. Uh, a span between two foundations to hold the body off the ground. Um, at my time at RISD, I was not really into furniture, I was more into structure and materials. But the idea of furniture was more to me just an idea of a challenge to a, um, furniture was a, a vehicle to, uh, of building to interact with the body in a structural method. It wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about furniture. Um, <clears throat> uh, that, that, that process of coopering is relevant in all these pieces and the other stuff I did while I was there. Um, and it carried on afterwards, I kept on, I kept on coopering. And this is kind of the final, my final days of coopering for, for a little while. But this is all masonite, and these are like little, little balls that I made that were just kind of fun, but they were, they were a way of using old materials and making something new out of it. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, because I, was, I wasn't at school anymore, and I, I couldn't figure out what I was doing. I was working for different architects, uh, making their designs for them, basically a subcontractor. Uh, this is a 10 foot long needle. And this is around the time I, I was trying to figure out if I should go to grad school or not. And um, I made this needle. It's basically, it's, it's ash and it's only an eighth of an inch thick, but it's 10 feet long. And it has lead shot in the, in the back area here from a gun store. And so it's really heavily weighted. So you can balance this thing on your fingertip if you can handle you know, 40 pounds of lead shot on your, on your finger. And 
You know, it's just a metaphor for me, like making a big decision and leaving Rhode Island to go to Madison, Wisconsin for, for grad school. Uh, I wasn't used to the winters or anything. That, that was, that was a, yeah, eye-opening. So at the time when I was going there, I was always into shell forms, shell structures, inside, outside. I've always dreamed of like, being able to rent a large x-ray machine and just take x-rays of things. There's a lot of things I was fascinated with. Um, shell formations, uh, natural formations, organic growth, all those kinds of things that most artists are influenced with. Um, but I was still obsessed with coopering. And when I got there, I made a deal with my professor that I would never cooper again, that I would, I would try to move on. And I agreed with him, but uh, I started learning uh, 3D modeling programs. And there's a 3D modeling program at, at Wisconsin that they were pushing really hard, and it's called Rhinoceros. And uh, it's an excellent 3D modeling program. And it's, it's made specifically for amorphic uh, engineering and amorphic design. So, you know, any kind of design where you have curves and shell structures or membranes, exactly the things I was really into. Um, and there's a really easy tool on there to use, which is the rotate tool. <laughs> so you can, you can basically make, a, you can make a, a profile line, and then you rotate that line around an axis, and it makes a solid. You know, whatever, that, whatever your crazy line is, you give it the axis, you rotate it around. It's like using a lathe or anything. It's just, it automatically rotates and makes its form. And it's fun to play with, but it was, you know, at that point it's like, okay, so you can play with it on the computer, but now how can you actually build it? And that was my challenge at the time. So I thought, well, with coopering, if I could figure out a way to cooper anything I want, then I can basically build anything I want, anything that I can design on the computer I can build. And so this was the first attempt at that. So um, this is a 3D model rendering on Rhinoceros. And um, there's a curve that's rotated around an axis. The model here on the left is put together. Here is what it looks like before you put it together. So it's made out of all these laminations of wood. And laminations are just strips of wood that are laminated together on a mold uh, with glue. When the glue dries, you take the laminations off and it holds that curve. So I can make 30 of these little parts identical to each other using a mold. And then I cut them to the right angle and put them together. So that was the, this is the first one. So this one is, I don't know, it's like 37, 40 inches, I think, in length. It's totally hollow. It's, it's just like this model. Um, maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch thick walls. And so, okay, so that was that one. So then I figured, this is in one semester. But then, so then I figured if I could do that, then I could take this curve here, which is a much more complex curve, just because it, it comes back into itself. And now if I rotate the axis from this right here, it's one form, because it, it rotates around this direction. But then if I put a rotational axis over here, then it's a whole different form, completely different, different thing. And so that's, that's the axis that's rotating like this. So that was that form. And to do this, I found, I found a trick in making these things really fast. They're not, they're not crazy, laborious things. And then this is the other one. So, it's, so they're based on the same, they're exactly the same geometry, just rotated around different axes, opposing axes. And at this point, I was pretty frustrated. But this is my last thing I ever coopered here. Um, and I was in art school, you know. I wasn't in design school. I wasn't in engineering school, in art school. And when you make things like this in art school, they ask a lot of questions. And it's... At this point, I was getting beat up enough, and I just needed to stop. Um, so I stopped, and I was really, I was trying to figure out what to do next. So uh, that summer, I, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, which is between two lakes. And uh, I always wanted to build a boat, and I never understood why boat builders and furniture builders, architects, engineers, aren't good friends. Like, they don't talk to each other. Um, when, you're, when you're in the furniture world, you don't really meet many boat builders. Um, if you do, it's, it's really, uh, it's, not, it's not informative, it's not, you don't, they, they don't share information. And they have totally different ways of going about things and completing projects. Um, and I understood why after I built this boat and uh, continued to build boats, I, I understand why there's not much of a discussion. It's, there are very different ways of building. Um, one of the main differences is the, uh, the use of measurement in furniture making. People are extremely, extremely precise with furniture building where they're, they're just, they, they rely on measurements all the time. 
with our boat builders, there's much more use of relative measurement, where something is measured relative to a curve and relative to the prior piece you put in, and the epoxy is used and things like this. Like there's different different methods are used in boat building that in furniture just would never would never fly. Um, but anyway, so I, so I built this boat. This boat was not designed by me. It was designed by a man named Platt Monfort in Westport, Maine. And uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he started off designing aircraft, and then he, he started designing boats in the, in the 80s. And um, the wood frame is uh, steam-bent white oak and fur, and then it's got a skin on it that's fabric. It's, made, it's called Dacron. It's made by DuPont. There's Kevlar strings that triangulate the whole structure to keep it from twisting. And the sail is made of Tyvek. So <clears throat> all the synthetic materials are all DuPont. The natural materials are wood. Um, uh, the boat weighs maybe 40 pounds without the, without the sailing gear. With the sailing gear, it's around 60. And I have this boat now for about seven years. And it's a, it's a good little boat. So this is in the summer. So this, is, this kind of changed my whole uh, take on, um, <clears throat> on working with wood. You know, before this, I was laminating wood to get to achieve bends. And after building this boat, then I, I, I realized how this how you can steam bend, steam bend wood. And also the idea of lofting. Um, uh, to, in, in order to build a boat, like I don't know if I can go to a good a good image of this thing. All right. Well, well, the hull of a boat is if if you if you break up the hull of a boat into sections, there's a you know the, the front of the boat and let's say let's say halfway through the boat and the end of the boat just to make it simple. If you made a cross section in the center of the boat, that that shape would have a certain a certain geometry or a certain contour. If you were to connect the geometries from the from the front of the boat, the middle of the boat, and the end of the boat, that translation of geometry that would be lofting. It would just be the, the translation of those contours to each other, and that, after seeing how simple it was to build a boat with that principle, I started to kind of blend it, lend itself more towards sculptural ideas or uh, structural ideas. Is this thing ringing at all? A little bit? Is that, is that better? Maybe. Um, all right, so, so the idea of lofting, can you still hear me or is it even? Maybe we'll just use this thing. Okay, I think this will be better. Hope my stomach doesn't go. All right, and this is this is a different presentation than I actually had prepared. I'm sorry. Um, I think I just I opened up the first one that came up. I had one that, that really explained lofting really well, but uh. Um, but if you look down here on the bottom right-hand side of the, of the sketchbook, you can see these, these ellipses. And so here's, here's an ellipse that's, uh, that's hor horizontal and slightly getting fatter, a circle, and then going vertical and going vertical, right? So with those cross sections, those are the like sections, let's say your mold sections, and the lines that are traveling along in this direction, those are the lofting lines. So those lines are translating those geometries to one another. So that's just a translation from a horizontal ellipse to a vertical ellipse. That's how simple it is. Loftings are really, really, really simple, uh, very simple mathematical way to make forms. And the computer uh, is a natural at it. So this was, this was my first attempt of using Rhinoceros, that 3D modeling program, to make a a bench or something that's not just on a rotational axis, um, actually using the program for its, for its lofting capabilities. And so this is a snapshot of, of the actual program. And so you can see the, the, red, the red perimeter marks in this model, and those are the actual lofting sections. And then the wood, the wood parts are what I planned for the, for the actual wood. Now when I built this piece, I was, I was planning to build it directly off of the uh, Directly off of the computer model, like mathematically perfectly to the model. Because I didn't, you know, I, I, at this point I was so taken up by the computer I forgot about materials and what materials would and wouldn't do. Um, 
And uh, I, after one week of trying to get the thing that would do agree, I just gave up on the computer and just put it aside and just I just built what I wanted to build without relying on the computer. And that was a really fast, hard lesson that the computer was really good to a certain point, and then this, there's a time when you just put it down. So it, now I only use it to help me visualize the ideas, but when it comes to actually building the pieces, it, it's only used as a visionary tool. It's not used for the actual construction whatsoever. Um, it's made, I use it to, like, to basically get familiar with the geometry of what I want to build. But then when it actually starts to become, like when I start to build a mold for a piece, then there's no mathematics off the computer or anything. It's just the computer is put aside. And then whatever the piece wants to do, whatever the wood wants to do, it let it happen. So that was the finished piece. And this, it's quite a bit different than the computer model. There's some metal stuff that I did towards the end of RSD. I wove, I wove a little bit of metal while I was there too, which actually, you know, came back later on. I, I didn't know I was going to come back to weaving, but now it seems like all I do is work with uh, strips of material that make a big form. All right. Oh, that, that was actually, to, with that bench that I showed you, that was the first computer model and bench. I was in the elevator going to my studio and I took a dollar bill and folded it in half and crushed it in the middle. And I thought that'd make a hell of a bench. So that's what, that's what actually started that, that thing. So that's, that's a really good representation of lofting right there. You see the red, the red things on the left and then you see the finished form on the right. Lofting used to be really complex, like 20 years ago. <laughs> Not very long ago at all. Um, but the computer has really, really, I mean, there used to be professions that all, all they did was loft for boats. So after I built that bench, nothing on here is uh, steam bent. Everything is under pressure. <clears throat> and the thing still is alive somehow. And there's no, there's no breaking joints or anything. But the, uh, maybe a couple, I think, if we're moving it around. But, um, but I realized I, I steam bent a lot of wood on the boat, but I didn't steam bent anything on here. So I'm, I was wondering now what, what could be the possibility if I apply this kind of technology to steam bending, um, what could happen? So I started you know, doing some drawings, go back to the sketchbook, and looking at architecture that is from the you know, 70s and 80s where they were using a lot of wood for um, lattice structures and Fry Otto and some really amazing architects, engineers. And a huge scale. Um, also, at the time, I was starting to learn a lot about steam bending, and I had to get all my wood from the farms. I can't get my wood from lumber yards. It has to be dried a certain way. So this is my place in Wisconsin that I used to get my wood. This pile of wood over here is all reserved for a major boat builder in Wisconsin. So this is the first, the first little piece that I made. This was actually downstairs, and. Um, <coughs> This is just off a whim to build this thing, but <clears throat> really simple, a really simple, small little bench. And with this thing, I, I noticed that there was a lot of structural problems with this bench, <clears throat> like just small structural things, but things that really bugged me a lot. So I thought, as this is a perfect, this is a perfect avenue for me because there was a ton of challenge in this method of working, and I couldn't find any books that really told you how to. You know, t told you how to how to work with this. You know, this is something that was totally new territory, and so it was really exciting. And this piece had problems, and that was exciting. So at this, when I was halfway with I have done with that other piece, I built this piece, thinking I could maybe solve the problems, the structural problems, if I made it more of a tube, you know, and kind of collapse the tube a little bit, maybe become more structurally stable. And it did, but the thing looks like a big walrus, and I wasn't really happy. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so so steam bending. Um, I'll explain it in two different ways, maybe. Uh, all right. Wood wood fibers are like little straws, right? And they make up they make actually wood. And uh, white oak is the wood that I use most of the time. And white oak is especially made of of really really tiny little cellulose straws. And the cellulose straws. Are held together by polymer resin, which is a natural, a natural plastic. And um, 
when when you when I, I basically have a big tube that gets to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, full of steam and moisture. And um, when I put the wood inside of this tube, uh, after about 10 or 15 minutes, I can pull it out. And the, those polymer resins that are holding all the fibers together have softened by that point. And I'm able to bend the wood into any desired shape uh, within 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Um, after that point, the polymer resins begin to harden and lock those fibers back together again. So they basically re reorientate the, the structure of the wood inside. Um, you know, because if, if, you, if, you, if you take a, even a strip of wood and you bend it when it's steaming, the outside of the wood, the fibers actually have to stretch apart, the inside of the bend have to contract, and then the middle of the wood stays totally neutral. But, um, so when you're steaming any wood, you're really reorganizing the internal structure of the wood and the, 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 the microscopic makeup of, of the fibers. Um, the reason why it's really important where I get my wood, uh, the polymer resins that hold the fibers together can be damaged very easily by drying. So like lumber yards, they dry the wood as fast as they possibly can and sell it as fast as they can. So they don't really give a damn about the health of the wood. So when you buy wood from Home Depot or something like that, it's all good for making stairs and stuff, but if you really want it to last a long time and want it to be like a really, really healthy wood, it's, it's, it'll, it'll check and crack down the road. Um, the wood I get it has to be air dried or solar, air, solar kiln dried, so it has, to, it has to be dried either six months or two years. Um, dried very, very, very slowly, as slowly as possible. So those, those polymer resins are very healthy and are flexible. So that when I heat them up, they don't just break. If I, if I try to steam bend wood from a lumber yard, the, the resins just snap and the, the wood snaps. Um, and I mean, for, for a steamer, the steamers aren't something you can just go out and buy. You have to, you have to make a steamer. Uh, you have to kind of rig it. And, <clears throat> and so I just use like a dry clothes steamer hooked up to a sewage pipe. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of details you have to you have to deal with, but that's pretty much what it is. Um, okay, so this is another tube, kind of a tube piece with a spiral rib thing going on the inside, and making make it kind of fall apart towards the end. It's called the lapidated flow. This is all in the same same semester of these things. Um, at the same time, I was also doing I do a lot of pen and ink drawings, and I think it's really important in my work just because of the line work and working with lines. The more I steamed that wood, the more I started to see that it was just like drawing in space. Like you can make, if you can make a, a line go in this direction and, and a line go in the opposing direction, your mind can start to formulate, like start to see a form in it. And that was really beautiful to me. It's like this, this piece was something that was just started by just a few different pieces of wood held together by string and clamps. And then I grew into this crazy eight foot tall monster. And this little guy. And these were all just kind of just playing with, like dancing with the wood. It wasn't really, uh, there was nothing planned in these at all. And that's the thing, I mean, steaming's fun because you have like 30 seconds, if that, to bend the wood into place. So you really have to work fast. So you have to really work with your instincts and know what you're doing. Like you have to know where you're going to go next, where you're going to go next, and it's, it's a lot of energy. Um, <laughs> these are bar napkin drawings. So this is, these are little uh, migration pods. And I wanted to, I wanted to uh, make a bunch of these little pods that, uh, I don't know, let's see. It's like, they, they, this is one of them, this is like a prototype. So it's for a little child, it's only as big enough for a little small kid. But they're gonna be little pods that have little holes in the sides for oars to stick out. So you can, you can row across the lake. And you'd have like 20 of these and people would just, they wouldn't know what's happening. That's, that's, that, was the, that was the concept. <laughs> I still have this thing, but I haven't, I haven't made the fleet. I don't know. So these are just more sketchbook drawings. This, I, I, my sketchbooks, I normally include a lot of uh, 3D models. Like there's a 3D model up there. So I'll just print out a little miniature version of a 3D model and just glue it in there so then I always have it as a reference point because I think the 3D models have become just as much, just as important as a sketchbook to me. Um, 
which I'm totally okay with now. I wasn't comfortable with it at first, but I'm totally cool with the idea of, of, use, of the computer being my other sketchbook. Uh, this piece is all riveted together, so those are all copper rivets, but they're all hand hammered copper rivets, so they're, um, you know, just like a nail with a washer and a peening hammer, which that's actually a process I'm getting back into right now. It's really fun because the thing, every joint is a flexible joint. They're extremely strong joints, but they're flexible. Each one's a hinge. Um, so when you sit on this, it's got a little bit of flexibility, but it's like a, it's almost like a hammock. And it's extremely strong, um, just flexible, which is really, it's a really, really cool quality. And these are the, these are the ribs for the Wright Brothers, the Wright Brothers plane. They, they actually use torsion lamination where they have, they have two, two sticks that are separated by blocks. Kind of like a, like the, like the bones of a bird, uh, hollow, hollow bones. And I, I use this in my work now, uh, a lot. Uh, it's an extremely important uh, technique for boat building too, but this entire piece was built off of that, that idea. And it's a bench that is, it's all built with that, with that idea of using the uh, negative space as a structural advantage. This is a really hard thing to sit on. Um, I, I fell in love with the tonic chair uh, when I was in I was in Haystack, uh, Maine, uh, as a teacher's assistant, and we went to the dump and we found a tonic chair there. And I've always loved these chairs. For, I didn't know why, but now that I was steaming wood, I understood why. They're they're extremely elegant, simple chairs, like the exact opposite of my work. I mean, really, really simple. Um, only five pieces to make up a chair, and designed in 1843 and really still a really elegant, beautiful chair. Any cafe you go to around the world, or any city you go to around the world, you'll see these chairs somewhere. I mean, these chairs are, are so popular and beautiful. Um, and so I made a 3D model of it on the computer just to really, really study it te technologically. And the mathematics the computer came up with were really interesting. Like, they really made some bizarre patterns on the seat, especially. So I, I took that chair that I found in Maine, and I took, it, I took it back to the studio, and I had it sitting there for a long time. I painted it black, didn't know what to do with it. And so then I just wrapped it with wood one night. It was like, and that's, whoop. And that, that became a really, a really important piece for me. I mean, it was like, it got wrapped really fast, and I had a ton of energy at that point. But um, yeah, that, that, that piece is, I think it's still one of my favorite pieces. Okay, so now along the side, along, uh, along the lines of everything else, I also make, um, I can't, I mean, making those big pieces, and especially now they're getting bigger and bigger, um, takes a ton of energy and uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. And while, while I was in grad school doing that stuff, I, you know, my hands would hurt, my body would hurt, I need, but I needed to do something, so I built really small, I started building really, really small sculptures. And these, these actually started even earlier than this, but I never took them seriously um, until grad school when two of my professors hated them, and then two of them loved them, loved these things. So I got enough courage to just keep on going with it and say, screw it, because like during, during a critique, uh, and then one of the sculptural critiques, remember it was an art school, not design school or anything, in art school, so, so they, one of the sculpture kids was like, you know, these are just one-liners, like there's no, I had maybe 10 of these things, and they said these are just one-liners, which is the most derogatory thing you can get when you're in a sculpture critique. You know, if somebody tells you it's a one-liner, it's not good. So I made, I made about 600 of these things. So, so that, was, that was my response, and it was also really fun to make, but then also in the end I could be like, yeah, because there's 600 one-liners, so that's, that's got to be like a page. Mm -hmm. So each one has a title, and some of them, some of the titles don't mean much, like this one, but uh, some of them do like that. I hope that's obvious to some of you. And some of them are off cuts from pieces of wood that broke off, you know, things like I find a piece of wood that was that broke in an interesting way, I'll put it aside and save it for later for one of these things. That's from yeah, Bob, Bob's B612.
<laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, this was turbine. Horology complication. C. Heal. Striking migration. Cast. That was, that was, that was meant as like a body cast, I think. Automat uh, automaticity, automaticity. Breakup three. Periwinkle. Note fifty eight. Mister. <laughs> Narcissus. <laughs> Note seventy five. Naked Umberto. I feel like Naked Umberto came from. I think it. Oh, I, I can't remember how this. I think I was just Google. We were Google imaging with a friend, and there was a picture of Naked Umberto on my computer, and I was making this piece, and it looked like the same stance of Naked Umberto. Okay, so I also made a. Uh, I, I, I needed to. How much time do I have here? <clears throat> when I when I was when I was almost done making a, a lot of those things for my MFA show in grad school, um, I realized I should really, I, need, I needed some kind of a case or something to carry with me because I, I liked making those things at home, in the studio, wherever I was, in the coffee shop, anywhere. I didn't have any kind of case, so I wanted to make like a nice, a nice briefcase or a box or something to, to carry my tools and all my parts and everything to, to make them. And so one, like, I had like a week off from school or something, and I, I was in the wood shop and I thought, and I'd really love to just make a beautiful box, you know, to make these things. So I started making like finger joints, like dovetails. I was trying to make this really beautiful thing. And after about an hour and a half, I, I got really frustrated. I couldn't make a joint. So I just, I, I threw it aside and I just found some old boxes I had and cut them apart and made a box, my briefcase, the same way I make one of those sculptures. So this briefcase is just made of tons of different parts of boxes, uh, cigar boxes, every kind of box you can, any kind of wooden box you can imagine and just put together. So I used joints that were already made. I didn't have to make any joints. Um, so the top, the top part of the lid carries all the tools. The bottom part carries all the parts for the, for the, for the sculptures. And then it closes all up and it locks, it locks up like a briefcase. The combination is zero, zero, zero. <laughs> okay, so now I'm getting, uh, this is the time, this is my third year in grad school now, and now uh, at the very end. And I got, I'm getting much more, uh, um, in tune with the computer and how it works and how I'm using it. And the 3D models are making a lot more sense and I'm starting to actually push, push the materials a lot farther. So this is a 3D model <coughs> of a large seating piece. And this is in, in progress. And it's a finished piece. This piece is called Providence. And this is the first piece where I really saw how this thing could take, <clears throat> how, this, how this kind of uh, technique could really go somewhere. It had legs. And I don't know if you can see it in one of these pictures, but maybe in this one, no well, kind of. Towards the bottom of the structure down here, you can't really see it so well. And I think it's more relevant on the, prevalent on the other side. But the structure actually, um, towards the bottom, it curves back out to meet the floor. Um, that's an extremely important structural part of all these pieces that I found through this piece. Um, that, that does a ton for structure, but it also does a lot for formally of how, how the piece meets the floor and had the elegance of it. Um, but for structure, it's a huge, huge, huge deal because it's just like, it's just like the crease in your car door. You know, to make sheets of steel strong, they put that beading on the car door to make it so it's not just one piece of steel, it's actually acting as three pieces of steel in different directions, lateral pressure. With this, it's the same kind of, it's the same idea, just act, adding that beading to the bottom of the floor gives it much more compound strength. It's in the shadow here, but it curves out right there. Drawings. <clears throat> that's a 3D model. It's just a skin of a, of a piece that's downstairs called uh, Riverlet. And that's a top view uh, line model. This piece.
And that's the front view of the line. The, all the dark lines are the actual what the molds were. So this was this was a mold right here. That was a mold. Those are those are the actual cross section molds that I that I lofted between. And in a sense, like the these these thin lines that go in this direction are the the lofting translations of these lines. I think this was this was in Popular Mechanics a long time ago, but this is something about about the the frigates being hauled by ships. A lot of neat things like that, and soap bubbles with ink. some point, it's kind of like wrapping a chair in wood. I, I at some point wrapped a, wrapped a big ball of wood and left a hole in it so I could stick my head in it. <laughs> All right, so now, some of the, the stuff that we do now, a lot of it is, is designed specifically for clients that have a, a specific space, whether they're architects or private clients. Um, for this particular piece, the, they had a certain architecture that they wanted me to build a piece for. And they had you know, basically a, a window in a certain area, a bar in a certain area, a staircase in a certain area, and then they just give me it. Luckily, this guy's house was completely built using the same program I use. Um, so I was able to just get the 3D model and build my piece inside of there. But um, it's a really interesting way to build things because I have, I like to work with limitations and constraints. Without that, and it's like, it's, it's you know, that can be anything. Um, so I basically use the constraints of the space to design the flow of the piece and how people, you know, move through the space and all, all those kind of things. And it's a really, it's a fun way to work because everything is so fluid and the way our bodies move through space is fluid. So it's, it's a really nice uh, conversation to have. That's a side view. The side view looks like it really, it looks, uh, yeah, looks kind of scary. I don't know if that shows up. It's pretty light. And so this was in the studio where I was building the piece, that, that large one. This is the largest piece I built at that point, and this was, I was really doing it kind of blindly, because um, I, I was in a live workspace at the time, and that gray thing in the background, um, whoop, back here is my door. So that was the way this piece had to get out. And it's, a, it's a standard door. And this is more than eight feet wide, so it can't fit on a flatbed flat. And this is a piece that's downstairs. <laughs> Forgot. Um, yeah, we have to move that pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, so this is getting out of the building. So it had to go vertically and then twist its way out and then onto a flatbed but up at an angle so that it was, it was eight feet or less. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to, go, to travel. And I forget how many intersections this piece has, but this, this piece has, a, a, I think this one's upwards of, it's over 20,000 intersections, I believe, in this one. And that's in its home. And this one, you can really see the recurve on the bottom of the structure right here. And when you go downstairs and see it, if you do, like that, that recurve is extremely important. If it didn't have that recurve, these things would uh, not be nearly as strong as they are. Uh, somewhere in, the, in, in around those, that time, I was making I made a metal bench. This is all torch bent with just a, an oxyacetylene torch and a MIG welder. And Slightly successful, not really. I mean, when you sit on metal like this, in the summertime it's hot, in the winter it's really cold. It doesn't really make sense to make a metal bench like this, I don't think, unless it's going to California. Um, but right now I'm working on uh, designing larger larger metal benches for just something for outdoor. But I'm thinking the, the internal structure will be metal and the external structure would be wood. So when you sit on it, you're touching wood, not metal. And the wood is, you know, um, can stand up to weather and uh, longevity. But it's fun. I mean, messing with the computer, doing the computer renderings, you can really see how these kind of forms will play with exterior environments or public environments.
and more 3D modeling. It's fun with the 3D modeling, we can do these renderings very, very fast, so it's really easy to dream and just look at what's going through your head. And if you work with a computer, the more you work with a computer, the more you think like a computer, I think. But I think it could be it's an okay thing if you if you if you take note of that. Um, but it's great because you can really sketch really fast. You can make like 15 or 20 of these sketches very, very quickly and really look at it and then you can rotate it around in space and look at it from all different angles and um, tweak it, you know, and do, do all these things or just delete it and do another one. Uh, I, used to, I, used to make really, I used to make small three-dimensional models all the time before I started getting into the steam bending stuff. And um, I've tried making three-dimensional models of some of these pieces and it's, it's nearly as difficult as building the actual thing. But the virtual, virtual models work pretty good. So this was, this was a commission for the, this client wanted two of these pieces, but this, this split in the middle came later on. Um, they're gigantic benches, they're 27 feet long. And it's for a new building in New York City. It's on 29th Street and 1st Avenue. This is in the studio. I had to rent an external studio for this. Um, uh, just to build these pieces, and again, this is one of those things where I built it in there without knowing how to get it out, get it out of the space. But, but in the end, they wanted them cut in half, so it really didn't matter. But, but this is just setting up the main mold, <coughs> and that's in the two separate spaces. <laughs> that, that's uh, that's George. He was my intern during that project. And there's a lot of wiring involved. Every joint has to be wired before it's glued on. So it's, he, had to, he had to wire about 44,000 joints. <laughs> I, I helped him. He didn't, he's not the only one that did that. Um, this is when they were done right before delivery. We were, there's a big space near my studio where we, can just, where we were able to set it up and look at it from, from above. But it was nice because when, when we had this much open space, we could really we could play with the uh, arrangement of these different sections. So cutting them was actually kind of a, kind of a beautiful thing because we could really we could really uh, see unexpected forms when we rearranged. Uh, the place where it lives now, they don't really have the space to rearrange them. That's a good song. That's fine. That, that, that was nice. I liked it. <laughs> so this is where they live now, and it's like they, they just they keep them hugged hugged along the window here, but I don't think they ever arrange them in different different arrangements. But it looks neat. Like they, they it goes good. I think with the stairs and all that. <clears throat> and then this is the other. This is the piece that's downstairs. Uh, the smaller one that's got its own little room down there. Uh, it's called Drift, and this was this was in progress. I think maybe like three weeks before the show here, <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, but this yeah, this is a really really complex piece to build. Um, I don't know if you can tell when you look at it down there, but it's. I think I have an internal shot of it on this on this show, but this is a really really tight compound curve piece that. Throughout, like most of the pieces, the bigger scale pieces are easier to build than this one because you have a whole segment where it's pretty easy bends, and then you get some really complex steaming areas where you have to really force the wood in there and you know really manhandle it. For maybe a little section, and then the rest of it's easy again, and it gets maybe tough again. But this piece was tough all the way along, all the way along for the wood to work smoothly and flow correctly. Every single bend was a huge pain. Um, just to force it in, I mean, it was it was a nightmare, but it was but it was really exciting in the end, really satisfactory to see how beautiful it was. And here you can really see this this curve right here, that is nothing in, like <clears throat> that's not there for detail or anything. That's strictly for structure. But in the end, they are one and the same. And that's the whole point of all this. I mean, it's structure, beauty, function, form, all that stuff is just kind of like a harmonious thing. That's what I'm like striving to try to achieve. You know, that's, I think, the goal.
And that was that, this is this is I think the last shot in the in the presentation. But that's when at the end of that we were shooting photos inside of a warehouse, and we were leaving the warehouse, and the sun was going down in Philadelphia. And I was ready to we were going to leave a piece in the warehouse overnight. And we turned around and saw the saw the blue light on this thing, and I, we took like one last photo, and that was that was that shot. But it looks like a looks I've never seen lines like that on one of my pieces, and it looks really kind of blew me away. But that's it. Thank you. So I don't know if, if you guys want to have uh, can do Q and A. I think there's a microphone somewhere, isn't there? Where is it? Oh, there's a microphone back there in the back behind the projector. You guys. This is a microphone. Good. Uh, I have a suggestion and then a question. The suggestion is you got to get someone to do a video of you putting these pieces together. <laughs> I think it would be the most amazing thing, really. That'd be, that'd be good. Um, the, the, the question is, as I understand it, when you're doing the steam bending, once you take the wood out of the steamer, you have a relatively short period of time in order to achieve the curve or the shape that you want. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> And I'm wondering how much of these uh, pieces, the, the ultimate uh, product from these pieces, uh, is the in inspiration or serendipity of that process as opposed to the original computer design. In other words, is there tremendous divergence, or are you able to keep it pretty close? It, it stays pretty cl Yeah, it stays pretty close. It's an awesome question, because yeah, like the, sometimes when you're bending, you just, when you have 30 seconds to bend it in the right shape, sometimes the, the wood just doesn't want to, just, just not going to do it. So I bend it as close as I possibly can, and then sometimes the wood will force it off the mold a little bit, and at that point, you just let it go. And I hold, I hold it on there with a string to hold it you know, close to it, but for the most part, the computer, the computer part of it goes out the window right away, right when I start building it. And then the steam bending and just kind of intuition take over, and uh, that's, it just goes on from there. So the, but for the, but for the freeform pieces, the steam bending is everything, and there's no 3D modeling. It's just steam bending and just wrapping, wrapping wood in space. Oh. Yep. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, um, what kind of uh, background in mathematics do you have, and uh, like in to what extent what, does that uh, play into your work, or is it just kind of free form, uh, free from like calculation or form? Yeah, no, no, back, um, I, I don't know. I was never good at math. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering whether the program that you use also does a stress analysis, or have you ever thought about having somebody do that? I mean, it looks like a finite element model to start off with. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. There's a, there's a plugin for it to do stress stress analysis, and I had a friend uh, do stress analysis on on one of the pieces. The thing is, we, we had to assign a material to the stress analysis, and we didn't have anything for white oak, but we but we assigned uh, steel for the stress analysis, and it was it was awesome just to see the graphic of the stress analysis. But I think if I ever if I ever uh, do like a public a public commission for public art or a public public bench or something like that, I think I would have to get a stress analysis, you know, through a 3D model just for for the <coughs> for the committee. Okay. But yeah, it's that, that program has a ton of plugins and a lot of a lot of options for uh, analysis of structures. Thank you. I want to understand your process a little better. Um, when you make the mold for a piece, especially one of the larger pieces, do you make you make a mold that's the entire form you want to have end up with, or do you do it in sections? Uh, the, the entire form. Okay. And it's, uh, it's, it's a skeletal. It's like a loose uh, skeletal mold. So the first thing would be the cross sections. Right. And you just cut those out of like plywood or something? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, just plywood, just like a boat. Uh-huh. Um, and then when, when you're actually in the bending process, do you have assistants who help you on the longer 
building log of pieces? Yeah, for the, well, for, for the pieces that go along the form, that's not one piece of wood. Those are all scarfed together. So those are all small pieces of wood that are joined together to look like one piece of wood. Um, what's, but, the, yeah. what's the longest piece you would do as a single piece? For going along the form? I mean, it's usually, my wood usually is only like 8 to 10 feet long. Uh, so I can do that by myself. That's easy because it's not, it's not a very dramatic uh, bend. But the hard ones are the inside, like uh, where the, like if you have a piece that has a, um, like a, a seat profile, mm -hmm. right? that's almost nine feet in length. That one, and that's a really complex bend because that's a bend hard here, hard here, hard here, hard here, and then down there. So it's a lot of bends. So on that, I have to have somebody on each side of the piece, and it's nine feet. So that's, that's why I have to have uh, assistance. But, but, they're long, but the pieces that go along the length of the piece, those are, those are just me. Those are, don't, don't need anybody for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned riveting one of your pieces. So I wonder if that's how you join everything, and, and how do you handle the movement of wood, particularly the wood that's exposed to the outside? <laughs> uh, nothing's been exposed to the outside yet, <laughs> but, uh, except for that one riveted piece. Um, that's only, that piece that was in the slides with, with the rivets, that's the only one I've ever riveted uh, in, until my, three weeks ago. I started riveting, making a small piece uh, that's, that's riveted together. But, um, and that piece that was riveted together in the slideshow, that piece actually was in Wisconsin for about a year and a half outside um, in Wisconsin, in Madison. So it went through you know, a harsh winter and, and the crazy summer and everything that Wisconsin has and held it really well. Uh, the other pieces are held together with marine epoxy and uh, tiny dowels, uh, sometimes just bamboo skewers. Um, and the wood movement, <coughs> the wood movement on the, on the bigger, on, on the pieces that don't use rivets uh, isn't really a problem because there's such small wood movement when it's in such small, small dimension strips. It's just there's not much. And I'm using a flexible marine glue. Um, Are there any? Uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> what wood do you use? What? What wood? wood uh, white oak and uh, uh, West Systems epoxy. Are there any uh, uh, sculptors, architects, or composers with whom you feel affinity? <laughs> um. I mean, before I even before I even made, started making sculpture, I was I was I was blown away by Martin Purrier before I even like, started thinking about wood as a material, which is crazy to think about now. Now everything comes in full circle, but you know, I, I, I love Martin Purrier's work. That's probably the person I think drew the most inspiration from when I was younger. You seem to have done a, a, a large number of pieces for such a short period of time. Uh, how many hours do you devote to, a, let's say, a, a medium-sized piece that we might see downstairs? Um, I don't count the hours. Uh, I think I count more like the weeks or months. I mean, like for for uh, um, the big piece downstairs is difficult because I was, I was doing a lot of different things at the same time while I was building that. But the, 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 there's a smaller one down there that's in a, the room, the, the one called Drift, and that was that was basically the latest one that's down there. And I think that one has a total of about a month I think, of, of working on that one, if I condensed it, about a month. But I also had, had help on that one. Thank you. Uh, I think I misunderstood what you said before. Would you tell me what temperatures you like to get the wood to before you bend it? What temperatures? Yeah. Uh, I don't measure the temperature I let the wood get to, but my steamer goes between 350 and 400 degrees. And I, only, I leave the wood in there for maybe 10 minutes. Three to four hundred? Yeah. So you're superheating the steam? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have a secondary, what are you using, propane? No, I used, I used to. I started off using the turkey cooker, you know, and the propane. Yeah. That's um, what I use now. <laughs> that is what you use? <laughs> that, that's what I was using in the beginning, and that was, this was like, this is like, this is hot steam, but it's really, it's, uh, that turkey cooker and propane, I was getting hotter than that. Yeah. And that was dangerous. You know, it was like, it was like when you'd open a steam door, you have to, if you got steam on your face, you'd get the, you'd start uh -huh. to get burned. Um, now I just use a dry clothes steamer, a Jiffy steamer, which is a really good steamer, a uh, Jiffy steamer. But okay. It's better than like a wallpaper steamer or anything like that. But, um, okay. but the thing I started finding was the pipe is, the insulation of the pipe is really important because you can get the temperature way up there 
uh, without having an industrial steamer. Yeah. Um, so I use like a Schedule 80 pipe. Okay. Okay. But, I mean, yeah, otherwise you melt, you melt the white PVC pipe. Hi. Um, what kind of finishing technique are you using? Are you doing any pre-finishing before you assemble, or are you going ahead and uh, embracing the nightmare of, of finishing go. them as one? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 yeah, uh, the, the nightmare of finishing afterwards. It's like, it's got to be. It's, uh, and it's all hand finished. There's no sprain. So it's all, it's all uh, yeah, hand, hand finished. So it's basically putting finish on, sand the entire thing down, put finish on, sand it down, and put finish on. Uh, min, wa min wax wipe on poly. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where to? I, I don't know. That's, that's where I have no idea. Vermont first and then... <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'm not sure. Right now, right now there's a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of cool opportunities coming up, so I'm not really sure. Okay. Thank you.